Praise the Lord. It is so good to be in church this morning. Apostolic Church in Whitesboro, Texas. We have come to worship the one who is worthy and to acknowledge him in all that we do and say. And uh, we just want to worship him in song. Worship with us this morning as we lift up the name of Jesus. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw men unto me. Amen. Everyone is welcome. Nobody's excluded. Hallelujah, Jesus, you are worthy. Welcome, Holy Spirit, for we are in your presence. Fill us with your power. Live inside of me. Welcome, Holy Spirit, oh, we are in your presence. with your power live inside of me you're the living water never drying fountain the comforter and counselor take complete control Spirit, we are in your presence, fill us with your power, live inside of me, welcome Holy Spirit, we are in your presence, fill us with your power. Glory and Lord, we give you 
and you reign in majesty. Lord, you're worthy of all of the glory, and you reign in majesty. Lord, we give you praise. Lord, we give you no one like you. You are worthy above all. We glorify you and exalt the name of Jesus. We are in your wonderful presence and we thank you. Hallelujah. You are more than able. You are capable. We are blessed to know in whom we put our trust. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Thank you for touching this world around us. Thank you for touching our hearts. Thank you for filling us. Hallelujah. Oh, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time, time shall be no more And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there When the roll is called up yonder It's called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder I'll be there on that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share when his chosen ones Gathered to their home beyond the skies, and the roll is called up yonder. I'll be there. Oh, in the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called. Yonder I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. When all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called of yonder, we'll be there. When the roll
the world's still trying to figure that one out. Amen. But to the children of God, we know what truth is. Jesus Christ is truth. Hallelujah. He is the balance to all of eternity because he is God manifesting himself to his creation. And if we can just focus on him and his will, all the rest of this is going to take care of itself. Praise the Lord. Amen. What an exciting thing to know him. Praise the Lord. He knows us, whether we want to acknowledge that or not. He knows us. All right. But he wants to be close to us. And this is our opportunity to draw near into the Lord. Amen. To experience his joy and his blessings. We are so thankful that you can be a part of this today. We want you to be blessed. We want you to experience the glory of the Lord, the blessings of the Lord, and the promises of God. He has many promises that he has given to us, and we can take advantage of that. We are, as a church, we are starting what is called 40 Days of Fire, and it is a time for 40 days that we will dedicate to the Lord. Each week of that 40 days will be dedicated to a type of fasting, and each week we'll have a theme as we are reaching out to the Lord, and we are going to be petitioning God for specific needs as well as praying for needs in general uh, that are necessary and that are in this world that we live in. And in the first week, the focus <clears throat> in this first week, we're going to pray that we live a life of repentance and allow God to take away our stony heart. We want God to help us with a heart. And uh, for that to take place, we have to be repentant. And what is repentance? Repentance is surrendering our will to his will. Our, our life, we need to repent. In repentance, we, when we know we've done wrong, we acknowledge that we have done wrong, and we take that to the Lord, striving not to do wrong again, all right, amen, and asking for his help and forgiveness. And if Jesus told Peter, Peter said, Lord, if I forgive my brother seven times in a day, have I really done something? Jesus said, not seven times. He said, 70 times seven in a day. If he's going to put that kind of requirement on us, that we have to forgive our brother that comes to us and says, oh, I did it again. I am so sorry. Please forgive me. We have to forgive him. <laughs> Let that soak for just a second. If he's going to do that to us, if he's going to put that kind of requirement on us, what kind of requirement does he have on himself? You think he's going to ask us to do more than he does? I think that you'd fool yourself if you said yes. <laughs> that means he's willing to forgive us. But he wants us. Say, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, we hate that. <laughs> oh, we hate that. Amen. And sometimes we can't even see that we're wrong. There you go, being human. It has its hang-ups. Amen. We can live life and be doing things wrong and not even realize it until God brings it to our attention and go, Oh, boy. Oh, boy. I've been doing that wrong all this time, and I didn't even know it. And you know what you do? You repent. You say, Oh, God, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that wasn't pleasing to you or that that was wrong or that was or what that was doing, or what that was involved in, or what, you know? Amen. And so repentance is, it's the very foundation of our relationship with God. Your relationship with God won't start until you repent. Mine won't start until I repent. We have to acknowledge we have need of Him. We need His ways. We need His direction. Well, are you going to look at the government today to tell you how to live? You think they're doing it all right? I say that speaking facetiously. <laughs> Why? Because they have problems. And one of the big problems is, is they're getting away from the Word of God. So no, you can't go to them to find out how to live. How about your mom and dad? My mom and dad loved me and they were good parents. But they didn't live according to the Word of God. And as I've grown and matured, I realize there were a lot of things they did that I don't want to do. And it wasn't because they were evil people. 
because they didn't know truth. All the truth. Amen. The Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. You find truth, hold on to it. Don't ever let go of it. Amen. And so that's why we're here today, to find truth. And I also realize this in our journey that uh, there are things that we've done that we don't realize we can repent. We can turn that over to the Lord. And he'll work with it. He'll fix it. He'll cover it. He'll heal it. He'll deliver it. He'll cleanse us from it. He'll do that. He'll erase it out of the book of life because we've repented, because we've turned from that, because we've acknowledged our need of him and his will and his direction. And so there is such a power in that. And uh, it's a challenge. When, what have you, when what you have done, this is kind of the, kind of the title for this day, when what you have done is covered by the blood. And we've all done some things. We've all said some things. We've all made mistakes. Nobody's exempt from that, regardless if they fool themselves. As some people think they're perfect and they don't make mistakes. And bless their hearts, one day they're going to find out otherwise. But, uh, you know, uh, for the rest of us, amen. There's a point in our life when the things that we have done need to be put under the blood. Amen. And that's usually the moment we recognize it. And that's when we come to terms with that. And so as we go into our scripture settings that we have started off with, we start off in our readings in 40 Days of Fire, Genesis 1. And the first two days were Genesis 1 through 3 and then Acts 1 through 3. But I want to open up with a scripture in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 12. This is in the garden and they have eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which were the commanded of God not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And as a result, at that point, sin enters into all of humanity through their disobedience because not only did, get, did they get the knowledge of good off that tree, they got the knowledge of evil. If you're able to stand in honor of the word, let's do that this morning and give God the glory in that. We are so thankful for his word. Adam and Eve have partaken of the tree. They have run and hid. God has come into the garden. He's looking for them. And lo and behold, they are hiding. And in verse 12, <clears throat> the Lord is speaking to them and has asked them the question if they've ate of that tree. In verse 12, the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Wow, he just threw her under the bus. Okay. Verse 13, and the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. So she threw the serpent under the bus. And what we have here is sin entering into all humanity through disobedience. And God's question to Eve, what is this that thou hast done? I mean, what would you think if God said that to you? You know, that's like looking at you and say, I can't believe you did that. Look what you've done. I mean, I would, you talk about doom and gloom and despair and the end of the world and it's all over and I'm toast. Father, we thank you for your word this morning and ask you, Lord, to talk to our hearts and help us to grasp and understand your will, your reasoning, and your desire, and your great mercies, Lord, and the fact that you have come to seek and save that which was lost, God. And so, Lord, we are blessed this day to be able to call upon your name and trust in you in this. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you this morning. What hast thou done? Wow. Eve set on course, and I know all you women uh, have experienced some of what she said in order, and we men have experienced what Adam set in order. Um, they were in paradise, and they would have very possibly lived forever. Uh, they didn't have to till the ground. They didn't have to raise food. Everything grew on its own accord. 
all they had to do was just walk around each day and enjoy God's creation and the world that they lived in. It was a perfect paradise that they lived in. And uh, I think that was lost. <laughs> some reason I don't think that's still around uh, you know and we know the reason for that it was because of the disobedience look what they did look what they set in order now I want you to know first of all they didn't do anything that God didn't or wasn't aware of he knew what was going to happen God knew when he created all of us he knew what we were going to do what we were going to be what circumstances we'd be born in how we would get here what we would do you know, He's aware of all of that. And this is the awesome thing about our God. He's made a contingency plan for you. He's made a plan of deliverance for you. Amen. That is powerful. That is precious. But it is vital that you and I find it and take advantage of it. Amen. Now, let's move ahead because our second Bible reading that we are in in our 40 Days of Fire is in the book of Acts. And we started it out in Acts chapter 1. You'll notice that that was the beginning of the Old Testament in Genesis. And now, in the book of Acts, we are in the beginning of the New Testament. Because the New Testament starts with the birth of Jesus Christ. His death is 33 and a half years later. And then, boom, here we are in the book of Acts. So we're in the beginning of the New Testament, right? And... Uh, it's not starting a whole lot better because they crucify the Messiah. Amen. Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, brought sin upon all humanity, and Jesus shows up in the New Testament, and what do they do? They crucify him, murder him. So we're talking about things that are covered by the blood. And I hope that when this is through today, that we have a better understanding of what the blood of Jesus can and will cover. Amen. So Acts chapter, uh, let's see, Acts chapter 2. We're going to read verse 22. Now in Acts chapter 2, the beginning of it is when the Holy Ghost is poured out for the first time. And the disciples are all filled with the Holy Ghost, cloven tongues like as a fire set on them. They speak in new tongues. And all the crowd comes to gather and see what in the world has happened. And as they gather, they begin to mock and make fun of them. But Peter, which was the one that Jesus told he would use him mightily. Amen. He wound up being the leader of the spokesman for the church. He stands up and begins to witness to them. In Acts 2 and verse 22, we find uh, him explaining to the, to the men of Israel there what they've done. He says, you men of Israel hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Okay, remember this. God knew all about this. Nothing, nothing surprises God. All right. You have taken by wicked hands, have crucified, and you have slain him. Whom God hath raised from the dead, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Oh my. What have you done? Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He came to redeem you from your sins. And you determined in your hearts to murder him. And to crucify him. So we see in the beginning of Genesis. Starts off with a, oh wow, what did you do? And now we start off the book of Acts, the New Testament, and what have you done? It's like the worst thing you could possibly ever do. You've done it. What do you do? And listen as he unravels some of this mystery for this. Amen. Acts 2, Acts 2 and verse 32. He says, This Jesus hath God raised up, whom you all are witnesses. You know about this. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which you now see. What else does it say? And hear. 
So in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Ghost is poured out and they came around and witnessed the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, they saw it. They saw the Holy Ghost being poured out upon these people. They heard the Holy Ghost being poured out upon these people. This is all validating what Jesus taught. This is all validating Jesus' plan for us. And so we need to take these cues. We need to grasp what he is saying here. He said, God hath shed forth the promise of the Holy Ghost, which you now see and hear. Verse 34, for David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou on my right hand. Now, Jesus is our Redeemer. Amen. And in these verses here, he's letting them know that, you know, you did this. You knew it was happening. And God has shed forth the promise of the Holy Ghost. This is what you are witnessing here at this point in time. And he goes on to say, verse 35, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the Redeemer of Israel. And you have crucified him. Okay. Now, one of the reasons that I believe that this is being brought out to us in the scriptures is because how many of y'all think you've really done some bad things? We all do, probably. All right? And in our minds, in our eyes, in our lives, we feel like we have done some horrible things. But I don't think you can claim to have crucified the Messiah. That gets pretty serious. That's pretty intense. For God to send his deliverer to you and do you for you to be involved in him being murdered and being open to it and, and, and helping to facilitate it. As bad as we may have messed up and as bad as our history may be in life, uh -uh. <laughs> it's not that bad. Okay? This is one of the things that my wife has found being on the Zoom calls and learning about other parents that are battling with autistic children and finding out that, wow, I thought I had problems. I don't really have problems. That person there, that person, there, they've got problems. Amen. And so when you and I try to look at our own selves and our own lives and our own past and we see the history and we think, oh, man, I messed up. I, I, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that. I'm, I'm, I'm reaping for that. You know, I sowed those seeds. Now I'm having to pay for it. You know, we feel all of this condemnation and all this guilt. But let me encourage you today. You didn't crucify the Messiah. Amen. You didn't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The one thing that God said, don't do it, or you'll put a curse on all of humanity. You're not guilty of that. Amen. Yes, we're all guilty of sinning. We're born into sin. We're shaped in iniquity. We don't have any choice in that matter. Our parents were. Our parents are not perfect. And let me tell you this, because your parents weren't perfect, it doesn't mean that you're not perfect. You can't be perfect. Amen. Our parents did the best they could, just as we're doing the best we can. But you are not living for your parents, and your parents cannot live for you. And those that are parents here today, you know, you can't live for your children. You can't make their decisions for them. You can't make their choices for them. You can't, you can't do it. All you can do is pray for them, love them. And the Bible says, train up a child in the way they should go. And when they grow old, they'll not depart from it. Somewhere the light bulb will come on and go, oh, that was pretty smart. I need to start doing that. But there's a space in between there that nobody knows about. And We've all been there, and we've all made mistakes in that space. Amen. So, what is covered by the blood? Is there any limits to what the blood can cover? Because Jesus shed his blood on Calvary so that our sins could be covered, hit, removed, erased, taken out of the book of life so they're no longer available. They can't be found. They're, they're, they don't exist. What is covered by the blood? And I want to encourage you today, church. Anything can be covered by the blood. Amen. Anything. 
The only ones who are not redeemable are those that become reprobate, that have literally turned their minds, their backs, their hearts on God, and God says, fine, that's what you want, go. And he lets them go. And they are reprobate, and he lets them go because that's what they want. I don't know about you, but I don't want that to happen to me. Amen. And so therefore, with God's grace and his mercy, no matter what I have done, no matter what circumstances I've been raised in, God is able to cover that with the blood. Because here we're talking about the Jews who crucified Jesus Christ, the Messiah. God come to reveal himself to them. They refused to see him. And Peter's let them know that here. But listen to what happens. Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, the Jews are basically asking this question. We did this, what now? Acts 2 and 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? We have really messed up. You know, repentance, our heart has to be pricked. Our conscience has to acknowledge, Wow, I messed up. I should have done that. We have to come to grips with reality and we have to realize, wow, that was not pleasing to God. And then we have to come to that place like they did. What now? What do I do now? You know what's awesome about this? God's got just the answer for you. Amen. And Peter shares it right here. And the first thing he says unto them is repent. Acknowledge your mistakes to God and ask God to forgive you and be willing to turn from it. Now, if you repent and keep out going and doing it, repent and keep doing it, repent and keep doing it, repent and keep doing it, you're fooling yourself. We have to work at stopping the sin. Now, this is, this is complicated because for many of these things, we realize I can't stop. I've tried. Ever been there? I've tried. I can't. All right? I was there when I came to the Lord. I was a young Marine, and I had a very filthy mouth, and that was just a way of life for me. And I tried to tame my tongue. I tried to curb it, and I couldn't. It, it's, and the first thing I realized when I got the Holy Ghost was that, oh, man, i got to quit that. Help me, Lord. How am I going to? Oh, Lord. And so... And you know what happened? That's where the power of the Holy Ghost comes in. Because it gave me the power to do something I could not do within myself. All right? So God understands our weaknesses. He understands our past and some of the things we deal with. And he also knows this. There's some things you can't go back and change. They couldn't go back and, and not crucify Jesus Christ. That was already done. So how do you put that under the blood? How do things go on? How does life go on? So Peter says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So you've crucified the Messiah. Ignorantly, but you've crucified the Messiah. But if you repent because you acknowledge this and you realize this and you apologize for it, and let God you know that you, didn't, you don't want that to be that way, you'll repent for it, then you can be baptized in Jesus' name. You can go down into a watery grave and be buried and your sins covered because the blood of Jesus is applied in Jesus' name. So when we're baptized in Jesus' name, it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. Hear me. Amen. You didn't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You didn't crucify the Messiah. But you've done some things. I did some things. When I was obedient and I did what the Word of God told me to do, I went down in the watery grave and I was buried with Jesus in water baptism. My sins, your sins, are covered by the blood of Jesus through the name of Jesus. This is why the devil's working so hard in many Christian churches to take the name of Jesus out of water baptism. 
Because he knows if you go down in that water and it's in the titles, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, there's no name. There's no blood. You just got wet. And he can hinder you in your redemption. That's why it's important that we know what Jesus, Jesus made provision for us to be redeemed and delivered from our sins. And let me tell you this, God can cover it under the blood, but we must be obedient to his word. And you're going to find as we, we move on here that this, this is not just one little deal that happened here. This was Jesus' plan. This was God's plan for us so that we could be delivered from our sins, not delivered in our sins as some teach today. Some teach today that, oh, we're just sinners and we're saved by grace. We're still sinning and God's just forgiven us. No, that's not the way it works. We were sinners and we are saved, we are redeemed, we are delivered from our sins by the blood of Jesus and the fact that we are repentant and he is forgiving our sins. Now, we can go on a little ahead just so you know this. In James, he says, if we sin, this is after we've been baptized in Jesus' name, if we sin after that fact, he said, all we've got to do is ask for forgiveness. Amen. Just ask him to forgive us. Isn't that what Jesus taught us? Yes. Told Peter, 70 times 7 in a day. Here you and I are. Oh, I stubbed my toe again. Lord, I'm sorry. Put under the blood. Somebody say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Hallelujah. Oh. Oh. And yes, it happens day after day. Amen. We're going to find ourselves in that position. And let me tell you this, the greatest gift God has given to you and I, that we could remain a repentant soul before his throne. Yes. Amen. Because that's where I need to be. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about how perfect you are. It's not about how perfect your parents were or imperfect. It's about the fact that we remain a repentant soul before his throne. And he makes provision and deliverance for us. As you read on, listen to what happens. He says in verse 39, this promise is unto you, which were those Jews that heard him right then and there. All right. It's to their children. And then he goes on to say, it's to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So he's opened the door wide open to everyone. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. It's up to you to save yourself from this culture. Yes, it's up to me. I have to be responsible for myself. I can't do this for my children. I can't expect my parents to do it for me. You've got to make this choice. You've got to make this step. And then the rest of them are in God's hands, okay? What about the Indians? What about the Aborigine? What, leave them in God's hands. He's got that covered, okay? But what about you? What about me? Amen. I can repent. I can apologize, apologize to God for the things I've done and things I've been involved in. And I can seek to turn from that. He's made provision for me so that that can be put under the blood so that when the books are opened in heaven and the accuser of the brethren steps up and says, oh yeah, God, you remember how they did this and they did that and they did all these things? And he looks at the book and he says, uh, there's nothing there. What can be covered by the blood? Everything. Amen. Do you want it to be covered by the blood? Maybe that is the next question. See? Because sometimes we have reasons why we don't want it to be covered by the blood. Sometimes we as human beings have this, I deserve to suffer. I deserve to be reprimanded. I don't deserve this. Well, it's not about that. He loves us and he feels like we deserve it. That's why he made it available. So we need to step out of that frame of thinking and say, I need you, Jesus. I need your forgiveness. I need your deliverance. He goes on to say in verse 41, then they that gladly received his word, they obeyed him. What did they do? They repented. They were baptized in Jesus' name. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. huh? As many as gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So about 3,000 people came into the truth that day. Their sins were covered by the blood. And these are people who had been responsible for murdering Jesus. That ought to give you hope today. 
I don't, yes. I don't care who you are. That ought to give you hope. Because as dark as our path may seem, past may seem, the blood can cover it. It does not matter what has gone on in our past. The blood can cover it. God wants to cover it. Thank you, Jesus. The challenge is we have to want that also. And we have to be willing to be obedient and take advantage of what God has for us. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. Ephesians 5, verse 25. The Word of God cleanses us by revealing God's will. The Word of God cleanses us. Ephesians 5, and verse 25. He's given us an illustration. He says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he, talking about Christ, might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. This is what I mean. God did not, he's not saving us in our sins. He's saving us from our sins. He's delivering us from our sins. He does not intend on us continuing on in our sins and going to heaven. He plans on delivering us from our sins, out of our sins, so that when we get to heaven, we are pure, white, robes of righteousness without any spot, wrinkle, or blemish. Now, I know that's impossible for you and me, but not God. So we've got to go to his word and find out, okay, God, how do I accomplish this? How do we get to that point? Is this even possible? Well, it is because he's telling us it is. So it's up to us to take advantage of that. And it starts with repentance, acknowledging that we have a problem. Do you realize the biggest struggle that alcoholics face is that they do not know they are alcoholics? Most alcoholics will not realize or recognize the fact that they are an alcoholic until they have lost their family, their, their, their jobs, their possessions, and their world has crumbled and caved in on them. And then they realize... I'm an alcoholic. You see, that's the trouble with sin. So somewhere we got to stop and say, wow, maybe I need to get this right. Rather than just continue on the way that I've been going. This is what God gives us a chance. We can stop it if we recognize it. The word of God tells us what sin is. Helps us to know what the will of God is. That we can be obedient to him and do his will. And guess what he does? He opens that door for us. This is exciting. This is awesome because we have hope. No matter what we have done, no matter where we have been, no matter what the circumstances we are raised in, you know, some carry a stigma that because my parents failed, I'm a failure. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You're a child of God. It doesn't matter who your parents are or were, all right? It's not based on our parents. They brought us into the world because God let them. And you know why God let him? Because he wanted you. He wanted you in the world. Okay, I admit, we may not have grown up in perfect circumstances. But I'm not my parents. All right? I'm a child of God. God has made his salvation available to me. I, again, I can't live for my parents. If I could, I would help them with some things. I couldn't do it. Okay? But I can live for God. You can live for God. And it's not based on where we come from. It's not based on our parents. They could have been the best people in the world or they could have been the worst people in the world. doesn't matter. What matters is, is that you live for God. Don't let the devil stop you because your parents weren't perfect. Because none of us are, okay? And, and some people's sins are hidden and nobody knows about them, that doesn't make them any better or any worse. All right? Everybody's got problems. Some people's problems are obvious and everybody knows, well, they're a mess. So, we're all a mess. We all need God. And so don't let what has happened in the past that you have no control over, 
When I was a young person, there were things that I did. Yeah, I was not thinking. But guess what? I'm pretty ignorant. Bless my heart. Pretty ignorant. Okay. You think Adam and Eve would have ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil after all that stuff happened? I, <laughs> it wouldn't have happened, I don't think. If they could have grasped in their minds how it was going to mess them and the rest of humanity up, chances are real good that they'd have said, uh-uh, man, serpent, you go take a hike. I'm leaving that tree alone. Okay? But they, they just didn't really grasp how bad it was. And many of the things that we have done in the past, if we knew where they led to, we wouldn't have done them. Some of us would have. But anyway. Not all of us. Some of us just didn't know better. So now you're going to beat yourself up over ignorant moves and things that you did in the past. God knows you need deliverance from that. And he made a way for you to be delivered from that. And I am excited because he has made this possible. And his word reveals it. And so we are cleansed by his word. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, he kind of gives us a laundry list of sins. Some of the things that, you know, are sins. They're just things that we do that are wrong and we've done that are wrong and so on. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9, he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So that's the people who are doing these sins, all right? They're not... Uh, they're, they're not delivered from their sins, and they're not delivered in their or they're not they're living in their sins still. They're not delivered from them, obviously. All right. He says, "Be not deceived, neither fornicators." All right. That's uh, having sex outside of marriage, nor idolaters. That's worshippers of idols and false gods. Nor adulterers. That's having sex while you're married with other partners. Nor effeminate, which is a real problem today. Uh, abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortionists shall inherit the kingdom of God. So this is New Testament. Paul is telling us, you know, if you're doing these things, you're not going to make it. Contrary to some Christian teaching. But listen to verse 11. And such were some of you. You've done some of these things. You know what I'm talking about. You've been there. All right. But, somebody say, but, you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name, what's that name? Jesus. Jesus, in the name of the Lord Jesus, and, I like that, and by the Spirit of our God. Only thing you can do is repent. Apologize, do your best to turn from what you know displeases God. Rest is obedience. It's just letting God do what he does. When, you re when you're baptized in Jesus' name, it's all put under the blood. Everything up to that point, all right? Everything. You've done every mistake, every bad choice, every evil thing that you've done is put under the blood. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Jesus. This was not available in the Old Testament. All right? This is why they offered sacrifices every year. And what it did is it rolled their sins ahead for a year. And it rolled their sins ahead for a year. Because those sacrifices that they offered were not perfect. But the blood of Jesus was the perfect sacrifice that could redeem us. That's why Peter said in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or the washing away of sins. Okay? So verse 11, I'm going to read it again. And such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And you got the Holy Ghost. Acts 1 and 8 said, You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you. To what? Make you witnesses. How do you become a witness? Well, you know that, that bad mouth, that bad language I had that I could not get control of? The Holy Ghost delivered me from it. And they quit hearing me cuss. 
And I saw government. He, don't, he used to cuss all the time. Now I don't, I don't ever hear him say anything. Huh? Amen. Because we have what power to overcome those things we could not in our flesh overcome before. God knew it was not just enough to cover our sins. We needed deliverance from them. We needed power to overcome them because they come back to haunt us. We'd start going back and doing them again. This is one of the struggles that many Christians have that only live a life of repentance. They repent, they apologize, they're sincere and God blesses them, but it only lasts for so long and they wind up doing the things that they did again and again and again. But for those that are obedient and baptized in Jesus' name, they get the receiving of the Holy Ghost. They have power to overcome, amen, to deliver them from the different things that they battle. And what happens? Then they're changed. And they're a new creature. They get to walk a new life in the Lord. John chapter 3, Jesus talked to Nicodemus. I want you to know that what I'm telling you is what Jesus meant for the church. What Jesus meant for his disciples his disciples and for the work of God. In the Gospel of John chapter 3 and verse 5, Nicodemus is a religious ruler, a Pharisee, who has come to see Jesus in the nighttime. He's trying to figure Jesus out. He cannot and so he's asking Jesus for some insight and Jesus gives him some insight. Verse 5, Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, or truly, truly I say unto you, except somebody say except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Except you're baptized in Jesus' name and your sins are remitted and you are filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. How many Christians know that today? I'm not just talking about sinners. There are a lot of Christians today who do not know that. They do not know that they need to be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sins. Because remission is through the name. The blood is applied and our sins are covered through the name of Jesus Christ. This is why it is so essential that we are obedient. And what Jesus was saying here is what the disciples were preaching and doing in the book of Acts. Amen. Peter said if you'll repent... You give your heart to Jesus and you'll apologize. You can be baptized in his name. It'll all be put under the blood. And then you need to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost to enter into the kingdom of God. All right. This is his plan. He goes on to talk about how this works. <clears throat> Verse 6, he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. This is a spiritual thing. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. Verse 8, he talks about those that are filled with the Holy Ghost. The wind blows where it listeth or where it chooses. You hear the sound thereof, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. He said, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. There is a sound connected. You can hear it as they speak in new tongues as the Spirit of God gives them new life and gives them power to overcome their old life and to be delivered and redeemed completely as God intended it to be. Luke chapter 13. We are winding down. Luke chapter 13, verse 1. Jesus is talking to the disciples and helping them to understand how important repentance is. Verse th chapter 13, 1. There were present at that season some that told him, talking to Jesus, of the Galilean, Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Or upon the eighteen, or, or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell, and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. What Peter preached on the day of Pentecost to the Jews that had crucified the Messiah is what Jesus had been preaching all along. We've got to repent. We've got to surrender our hearts and lives to him. 
No matter who we are, no matter what our past or our upbringing is, we have to. And it starts with repentance. And that's what our scripture settings we find in the book of Acts is, is where the church is at. That's where the church started. It started at repentance. And you know what? Your walk with God starts at repentance. It's apologizing to God for your failures, your mistakes, your shortcomings, and then seeking to obey his word and do what he wants you to do to become what he wants of you. Second Peter chapter 3. God does not want us to perish. All right? Sometimes we get the martyr attitude that I deserve to die. I deserve this. I should suffer. I should. That's not God's will. Amen. God wants us to do well. 2 Peter 3 verse 9. The Lord is not slack. He's not uh, sloppy. He's not careless concerning his promise as some men count slackness. He's not, he's not just putting it off and blowing it off. But is long-suffering. He's just waiting for us. He's being very patient toward us. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all, somebody say all, all. should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, when the heavens shall be on fire and shall be dissolved, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, Nevertheless, we look according to his promise and look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. God doesn't want anybody to perish. Adam and Eve, they had to repent. The Jews that crucified the Messiah, the disciples, they had to repent. So do we. Amen. But if we'll repent and we'll obey and be born of the water and be baptized in Jesus name it'll all somebody say all oh, I like that it'll all be put under the blood hallelujah this is why water baptism in Jesus name is so important to us all right this is where salvation enters in this is how we enter into the kingdom of God it's through obedience we hear we are washed by the water of the word when you hear this it reveals our sins and we are able to acknowledge our sins and repent and obey the word and be baptized in Jesus' name and we are washed, we are clean, we are cleansed and we are free no matter what our past has been and we all have a past, all right? We're all sinners saved by grace. There's none righteous, and none of us is perfect now, except the Lord counts us as perfect because we're obedient and repentant, and we're striving to do his will. And David says it this way. He says, blessed is the man in whom God will not impute iniquity. In other words, he does not hold you guilty for your flaws or mistakes. Why? Why? Because we've repented and we're doing our best to honor him. And so therefore, it's put under the blood. Amen. Your sins are not remitted because all of a sudden you just became all perfect and clean and did everything right now. It's because you obeyed him and you repented and said, God, from now on, I want to do what pleases you. And I need you to forgive me. The Bible says some men's sins go ahead to judgment. Some men's sins follow after. I want mine to get sent ahead. Because that's what happens when you're baptized in Jesus' name. They are taken care of. There will be no judgment. Those sins have been sent ahead and they are covered by the blood of Jesus. And so they are gone. You are reprieved. You have a godly pardon. Not just a presidential pardon. And you have godly pardon. And then we live for him and honor him in, in life living and and pray 
for those that were in our past. We can do that. Amen. Pray for those around us now. Pray for those in the future that we're going to come in contact with. But again, you live for God. I live for God. And his grace will see us through. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. So if that's the case, that means we can all be saved. Amen. We can all be redeemed. But according to this word, somebody's going to have to obey. Somebody's going to have to surrender. And he'll do the rest. And as we stand to our feet this morning, we need to make a commitment in our hearts as we enter into this 40 days of fire and into this journey, this new year. Everybody has been concerned and thinks this last year has been a, a bad year. It hasn't been easy. But God's had his way. And so therefore it's good. And God's working miracles and God's still on the throne and God's plans are still being fulfilled. And really all you have to do, all I have to do is keep living for him. And it starts with repentance and obeying, being baptized in Jesus' name. And then we go on to receive the baptism. He's the one that's going to fill you with the Holy Ghost. Amen. And that's, wow, here we go. Lord, we thank you so much for your mercy and your word today as it has revealed to us our need of you and the fact that you have made every opportunity that we need. Every man, woman, boy, and girl can take advantage of this gospel. Everyone on this planet, Lord, can take advantage of this great truth. And Lord, I pray that they would be willing to repent and surrender their hearts to you and they would be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ so their sins are covered so that they can go on to live a life of godliness in your presence and experience the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Some receive the Holy Ghost before they're baptized. I did. Lord, however you choose to work in our lives, we're excited and thankful for your mercies that you're not going to let anyone perish that wants to make it. And I want to make it, Lord. And these that are here today want to make it. We are here because we want to serve you and live for you. Thank you for delivering us and washing us. And we give you praise for all of this. And somebody said in Jesus' name, amen. amen.